And having said that, I will now read the relevant chapter in Maria Valtorta's writings, which gives us more detail of what happened at Caesarea Philippi 2,000 years ago. It's chapter 342, going towards Caesarea Philippi, Peter's primacy, given to Maria Valtorta on the 27th of November, 1945. The Jordan runs across a plain before flowing into Lake Meron. It is a beautiful plain where cereals grow more and more vigorously day by day and fruit trees blossom. The hills beyond which Kedesh lies are now behind the pilgrims who are walking fast at daybreak. They appear to be very cold as they cast keen glances at the rising sun and they look for it as soon as its rays shine on meadows and caress leaves. They must have slept out in the open or at most in a stack yard because their garments are creased and show particles of straw and dry leaves which they remove as they see them in the light which is becoming clearer and clearer. The river is detected through its gurgling which sounds loud in the silent morning in the country and by the sight of a thick line of trees the new leaves of which are quivering in the light morning breeze. But it cannot be seen as yet, sunken as it is in the flat plain, although it is swollen by many torrents flowing into it from the eastern hills. When they can see its blue water sparkle through the new greenery on its banks, they are almost on its bank. Shall we walk along the banks as far as the bridge? Or shall we cross the river here? They asked Jesus, who was alone, pensive, and has now stopped waiting for them. See if there is a boat to cross over. It is better to cross here. Yes, at the bridge which is just on the road to Caesarea Peneus, we might come across someone who's been sent to follow our footsteps, remarks Bartholomew, frowning, while he looks at Judas. No, don't look black at me. I did not know that we were coming here, and I've not said anything. It was easy to understand the Safet. Jesus would go to the sepulchres of the rabbis and to Kadesh. But I would never have thought that he wanted to go as far as Philip's capital. So they know nothing about it. So we shall not find them through my fault, or through their own decision. Unless Beelzebub himself leads them says calmly and humbly the Iscariot. Very well, because with certain people, we must be sharp-sighted and speak very carefully without letting them have any clue of our plans. We must watch everything. Otherwise, our evangelization will become a perpetual flight, replies Bartholomew. John and Andrew come back. They say, we found two boats. They will take us to the other side for a drachma each boat. Let us go down to the embankment. And they cross to the other side in the two little boats in two trips. There is a fertile plain also on this side. Fertile, but not thickly populated. Only the local farmers live there. Hmm, what shall we do for bread? I'm hungry. And there are no Philistine ears of corn here. Grass and leaves, leaves and flowers. And neither a little sheep nor a bee, grumbles Peter to his companions, who smile at his remark. Judas Thaddeus turns round. He was a little ahead. And he says, we will buy some bread in the next village. Provided they don't make us flee, concludes James of Zebedee. You who say that we have to watch everything. Be careful lest you pick up the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. I think that is what you are doing without considering the wrong you are doing. Be careful, very careful, says Jesus. The apostles look at one another and whisper. What is he saying? The bread was given to us by the woman of the deaf mute and by the innkeeper at Kadesh. I still have it here. It is the only bread we have. And we do not know whether we will be able to find any more to satisfy our hunger. 
So why does he say that we buy bread of Sadducees and Pharisees with their yeast? Perhaps he does not want us to buy any in the villages here.